Welcome to the Veritas Forum, engaging university students and faculty in discussions about life's hardest questions and the relevance of Jesus Christ to all of life. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org. The following material is copyrighted and may not be duplicated, reproduced, or redistributed without prior written consent from the Veritas Forum. Join us as we explore true life. Friends, welcome to the Veritas Forum at UC Berkeley. I would like to just ask everyone if you have a seat that's empty next to you, if you could just squeeze in. We're trying to fit in the last few people. To those of you who are in Vinnell, we do apologize. Wheeler is absolutely full, and we hope that um, the video experience there is going to be uh, acceptable. Um, so I want to just explain a few things. My name, by the way, is Unsi Fakhuri. I'm a graduate student at Cal in the astronomy department. And I uh, just want to welcome you all again. Thanks for coming. Um, we're going to have a few things happening while the talk's going on. Uh, we're going to have ushers in both Wheeler and Dwinell handing out clipboards. And what we'd like you to do is put your email address on that clipboard. We'll send you one email and one reminder email to, uh, with a link to an online survey that will allow you to give us feedback about the event. And those will be the only two emails that you will get out of that. So if, you know, I, I'd, I'd encourage you to do that. We, we do, we covet your feedback and we'd like to know um, what, what you all thought of tonight. Um, I would also like to tell the Dwinell people that they should have picked up a question and answer card. And I want to encourage you during the talk to write down a question if you have one. At the end of the talk and before the interview with Dr. Ryan, I'd like you to pass the cards down to the end of the row. And then the ushers will come and collect the cards. And we'll use those cards for the Q&A. All right. We're going to start now. And I'd like to introduce the Warren and Catherine Schlinger Distinguished Professor and Chair of the Chemical Engineering Department, Professor Jeff Reimer. Thanks, Auntie, and, and welcome again to this uh, exciting forum tonight. I'm honored to be able to introduce two extraordinary scholars tonight, and first our speaker. Scientists are enjoying an explosive growth uh, in the understanding of life. This is particularly true uh, when it's measured by our ability to treat human disease. Indeed, research and development in the life and medical sciences are poised to deliver medicines and treatments that are specific to the genetic makeup of an individual. And yet, scientists are experiencing political leadership and popular culture that rejects the fundamental tenets of biology. American Christianity is also undergoing an exciting change. Christians throughout America are beginning to shed a shallow faith that makes the church a shopping mall for spiritual cosmetics and instead are taking up the call of Christ in combating poverty, AIDS, sex trafficking, climate change, prison abuse, malaria, and genocide. And yet, Christians throughout the country have difficulty explaining human origins, whether via an intelligent designer, a young versus an old earth, or more likely, not explaining origins at all. We are fortunate tonight to have a speaker that spans in excellence, in excellence both worlds of science and faith. Dr. Sci Dr. Collins the scientist was homeschooled on a farm during his childhood and then emerged as a young scholar in the field of chemistry, first with his bachelor's degree from the University of Virginia and then his PhD from Yale. Dr. Collins made a dramatic switch in fields and left Yale for the University of North Carolina to pursue an MD then residency and chief residency in internal medicine in Chapel Hill. Dr. Collins went back to Yale as a faculty member and then the University of Michigan, where he would become world famous for the position would connect molecular genetics and DNA to genes that were identified in specific diseases, including cystic fibrosis and Huntington's disease. In 1993, Dr. Collins became the director of what is now known as the Human Genome Project, the project that maps the, provides the molecular map of human DNA. 
Dr. Collins has been recognized by many honors and awards, far too numerous to name here. I will just mention that he was elected a member of the National Academy of Sciences and the Institute of Medicine, and in 2007 received the Presidential Medal of Freedom. Dr. Collins the Christian rocketed to international fame with the publication of his 2006 book, The Language of God. Dr. Collins unabashedly shares his Christian faith whenever and wherever he can, be it in an editorial on CNN, an appearance on Comedy Central, an interview with National Geographic, or an NPR debate with Richard Dawkins. In student and faculty groups around the world, and I might add on the Berkeley campus, Dr. Collins's book fosters new debates, new insights, new critical thinking about the relationship between science, faith, and ethics. And it is that relationship that Dr. Collins will speak about tonight. Would you join me, please, in welcoming Francis Collins to the podium? Well, thank you for that very kind introduction, and good evening to all of you. What a pleasure it is to be here in Berkeley and to see this hall filled with people come to talk about this issue of science and faith, a topic which I think some people think there's nothing to say because they're not compatible. Well, I'm gonna have some other thoughts on that. Again, welcome to those of you who are in the overflow space. Uh, sorry that this auditorium could not accommodate everybody, but we are going to be interested in your questions, as you heard later on, uh, if in that overflow space uh, you can write them on cards and pass them in. We'll get them brought in here when we get to that point. So I'm going to start off with uh, uh, some reflections on this question of whether a scientific and a spiritual worldview can coexist within a given person. And if they do coexist, do they have to be walled off from each other in order to avoid some sort of unfortunate conflagration? And I will tell you that in my perspective, uh, they can exist, and it's pretty nigh impossible to wall them off. And in fact, I stand before you as somebody who is both a rigorous scientist who will not accept your conclusions about nature until you show me the data, but I also believe in a personal God to whom one can pray in expectation of an answer, and I'm a follower of Jesus Christ. How did that come to be? You might wonder. Well, I'll walk you through some of that. And in fact, I think what I should do is perhaps to start, we have a lovely echo of a sudden here, <clears throat> with uh, a bit of a quick primer on what's happened in the field of genetics, because I'm going to tie into that in some of the arguments I want to put in front of you about how it is that a creator God can be put together with what we've learned about life, particularly from the study of DNA. But I'm also in the middle of this going to get personal and tell you how I came to be a believer, because I think you probably deserve to hear that story as well. And it might surprise you that I'm not one of those who grew up in a home where faith was practiced. So my faith was arrived at instead at age 27, and primarily on the basis of rational argument. So let's go through some of those things, beginning with the science. And you've probably been hearing a lot about DNA, even if you're not a science major at UC Berkeley, because you can't get away from this stuff. It's everywhere on every magazine cover, it seems like. And here's one from a, about five years ago, actually, at the time that we were announcing the completion of the goals of the Human Genome Project. And uh, you will see, of course, uh, the double helix. Uh, you will also see two figures that appear to be Adam and Eve. And interestingly, if you look at covers of magazines that talk about DNA or the genome, they have one thing in common, well, two things. The double helix always appears. The other thing that always appears is naked people. <laughs> now, what do you think that's about? I think editors of magazines have figured out that DNA does not sell. <laughs> and they know what does. <laughs> So, okay, what, what is this stuff anyway, this marvelous information molecule of all living things? You can think of DNA as an instruction book, and you'd be pretty close to right. It's a pretty good metaphor. It's a book that's written in a funny language. It has only four letters in its alphabet, A, C, G, and T, which are actually chemical bases that reside in this double helix, and it's the order of those letters that determine the instructions that a particular DNA molecule carries. And all of the DNA of an organism is called the genome of that organism, and we have one of those. Our genome is about 3.1 billion letters in length, 
and we now have all of that information, and you can go back to the a place where you usually live and see what you can learn by pulling it up on the web and beginning uh, to sift through it, because that's the process we're in right now. 3.1 billion letters is a lot of information, but it's a bounded set of information, and that's actually kind of an interesting concept, that the information necessary to take all of us from what we once were, a single cell, and form this amazingly complicated organism is a bounded set of 3.1 billion letters of DNA code. Now that's still a lot of information. If we decided tonight we were going to read the human genome because it's such an exciting thing to do, I could uh, maybe ask people to take turns so that nobody got too tired and we'd sort of keep going at the pace A, C, G, T, T, G, C, A, C, A, T, about like that. And we all agreed we'd stay here until we're done, right? <laughs> Well, it'd be a bit of a long read because seven days a week, 24 hours a day, we would be here for 31 years. That's, and that information you have inside each cell of your body, is that not an amazing thing to contemplate? And every time the cell divides, you've got to copy the whole thing. Well, the Human Genome Project was established in 1990 with the audacious goal of reading out all of those letters. And in 1990, we really didn't know how to do that. And it was, in fact, quite scary for me to take on the reins of this project in 1993, when the baby was just barely beginning to uh, kick the slats in the crib. And we weren't quite sure if it was ever going to grow up. And ultimately, however, the great talents of scientists from uh, many different walks, uh, from physics, from biology, from chemistry, from robotics, from computational sciences, all got together and figured out how to do this at very high efficiency. The human genome, uh, this incredible storehouse of information passed from parent to child, the information molecule of all living organisms, not just ourselves. And yes, uh, we did have the experience, and it was rather poetic because it was almost exactly 50 years after Watson and Crick published their famous paper in Nature, April 25th, 1953, when we were able to announce that we had completed all the goals of the Human Genome Project and all of those letters of the human DNA code were now placed in public databases for anybody with a good idea about what they mean to begin working on them for the benefit of mankind. And this is, in fact, I think a cardinal feature of the Genome Project, which was to place all the data in the public domain every 24 hours, not waiting for publications, not filing any patent claims, basically saying, this is our shared inheritance, let's all work on it together. Well, that was five years ago. So what has happened since then? Well, I could give you a whole lecture on genome research, but that's not why you're here. I will just say one of the areas of great interest right now, and it's an extremely exciting period, is to try to identify those glitches in the DNA sequence because we're all not quite the same, and some of those differences actually can convey risks of illness. We would like to know what those are. And in fact, we're making substantial strides, especially in the last year or, to, or so, based upon additional genome projects that have followed after the DNA sequencing. And I think it's fair to say the major genetic risk factors for diseases like the ones that you see here are now being identified. And those were hard fought. And every one of them is shining a bright light on our previous ignorance about why these diseases come about. And that is going to put us in a position, therefore, uh, to be able to do things in a medical way uh, that will be truly exciting and are going to transform the way in which we prevent and treat disease. Because we have the ability, uh, using the Genome Project and the things that have followed after it, to identify these genetic risk factors for virtually any condition. That in turn, in a situation where knowing you're at high risk offers you the chance to do something to reduce that risk in terms of a preventive strategy, uh, can be implemented. Already we can do this, for instance, in some cases of colon cancer or perhaps diabetes where we know that we have interventions that somebody can use to be able to in enjoy a, uh, a higher likelihood of staying healthy. We also have the ability to use this information to be able to make predictions about who ought to be treated with which drug at which dose instead of the one-size-fits-all approach that we often take to therapeutics. And this is going to transform the way in which uh, we treat uh, diseases. And maybe most significantly, this window that we get to open up using the tools of genomics into why disease occurs is going to make it possible for us to choose approaches to treatment 
drug therapies and gene therapies that will be much more targeted, much more likely, therefore, to be successful, much less likely to have side effects. Uh, so it is, I think, a fair statement that in the next 10 to 15 years, medicine is going to be utterly transformed by the discoveries that are coming out today of the laboratories around the world that have worked together on this effort called the genome. So that's very exciting stuff, and this is what I do every day in my job as the director of the Genome Institute at NIH, trying to identify opportunities where we can go faster, bring people into this particular scientific field whose skills we need, and I hope many of you in this room are in some way or another either engaged in this or will be, because this is one of the greatest scientific adventures that humankind has ever had the privilege of going on, an adventure into ourselves, an adventure with profound potential benefit of a medical sort, an adventure which should benefit not only us in this country but around the world because the things we are learning are also applicable to disease li diseases like malaria and tuberculosis and AIDS. Well, that's the scientific part, but contemplate, if you will, for a minute this interesting pair of images and because this is where we're going next. I've been talking about this stuff on the right. And this is an unusual picture of DNA, not looking at it from the side, but looking down the barrel, the long axis of the DNA double helix. And of course, on the left, a familiar pattern of a wonderful rose window, this one at York Minster Cathedral. So I would ask you, do you have to make a choice between these two? If you're interested in the one on the right, does that mean the one on the left is no longer relevant and vice versa? Well, I'm going to argue through the course of this evening that it is entirely possible, in fact, quite satisfactory and comforting uh, for an individual to embrace both of these worldviews, the scientific and the spiritual. But let me tell you now how it is that I came to have a spiritual worldview, uh, namely that of Christianity. Um, I was not, as I mentioned very briefly earlier, born into that tradition. My parents were wonderfully creative people. <clears throat> my father a drama professor, my mother a playwright. Uh, they surrounded themselves with other creative folks uh, who were very accomplished in theater and music and the arts. I grew up on a small farm in the Shenandoah Valley, was homeschooled by my mother before homeschooling was cool. and. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, and the truancy officer was very suspicious about this whole thing. Uh, and I learned from my parents the joy of discovery. I learned about how exciting it was to learn new things, but I didn't learn much about faith. It wasn't that faith was denigrated in my household as I was growing up, it just wasn't considered very important. And so when I got to college, and sitting in the dorm having one of those conversations about big questions, and there's always somebody in the dorm whose job it is, at least they think their job is, to basically destroy anybody's faith who got there with some, and they want to be sure they leave with none. <laughs> and that was John Sneed on my hall, and John was quite effective in taking the tiny little shreds of faith ideas that I had and pretty much dismantling them because I didn't have any foundation upon which to rest them. And so I decided, well, that's a pretty uncomfortable topic, and it's really much better from my perspective anyway if this isn't true, because then I don't have to be responsible to anybody else. And so I became an agnostic. I then went off to graduate school, because I was enamored of physics and chemistry, and I did a PhD in quantum mechanics. And my joy of every afternoon was wrestling with really beautiful second-order differential equations that <laughs> They were, they were, and they described the universe, and this was really wonderful uh, mathematical uh, opportunity. And, and uh, as I slipped more and more into that kind of uh, attitude that mathematics was all there is, I frankly became a uh, frank atheist, not just an agnostic, but an atheist. And I would not have been somebody you would have enjoyed having lunch with if you had talked about faith during that meal, because I would have taken on the John Sneed attitude of trying to destroy your faith, too. And then something happened. Something happened professionally for me. As much as I was enjoying the explorations of quantum mechanics, I began to be aware that there was something going on in biology that I'd kind of missed. I thought biology was hopelessly messy, that there were not really going to be any satisfying principles that undergirded all of this descriptive stuff that I had heard about. And I discovered that I'd missed something profoundly interesting about the digital nature of information 
namely DNA and RNA and protein and the way they all work together. And I got increasingly interested in reading about that instead of my own uh, literature that I was supposed to be looking at. And after a while, really felt this call to do something different, and namely to change my direction into life science. Not knowing quite what to do at that point, I decided to go to medical school. <laughs> I know, it does seem a little strange, doesn't it? I mean, had I ever had the slightest inkling to be a doctor before that? Not really. Why those folks at the University of North Carolina took this story and offered me admission is still a mystery, but they did. And I, and I enjoyed medical school enormously from the very get-go. Yeah, there was a lot of stuff to memorize, but it was all about the human body, and it was also intricate and elegant, and it all kind of made sense most of the time. Uh, but then I got from the classroom part into the clinical part, where my job now was to take care of patients. And I realized my wonderful ideals about how I would step into the room and suddenly everybody would get better were, was not exactly what was happening because most of the patients I had to take care of were people with far advanced diseases of the chronic sort that our medical tools were inadequate to treat. And that was pretty frustrating, but it also put me in touch with the personal side of some really remarkable human beings, people who were facing the end of their lives for whom medicine had pretty much run out of options. And yet many of those good people did not seem angry about that. They seemed at peace. And when I asked them about that, many of them would say, well, I've lived a good life, and I've trusted in Jesus, and I know that that's going to see me through. And I am peaceful about this. I have great comfort. My faith gives me that kind of rock of support that nothing else could. Well, you know, I'm an atheist. What's that about? That seems like the biggest psychological crutch I ever heard. <laughs> but boy, it seemed powerful. That was puzzling. And I wondered about that, but I tried most of the time not to think about it. And then one afternoon, a patient of mine, an elderly woman who had very advanced heart disease, for which we had really kind of run out of options, uh, turned to, uh, to me after a really bad episode of chest pain and shared her faith with me uh, and told me how that was the way in which she got through those experiences and talked about how the, she was not afraid of what was to come. And then she stopped and looked at me quizzically. She said, you know, doctor, I just shared something very personal with you. I just told you about my faith. You didn't say anything. What do you believe, doctor? Boy, I didn't expect that question. And suddenly the ice under my feet felt like it was cracking. Uh, suddenly this enormous sense of disquiet sort of overtook me that I wasn't prepared for. And I stammered something about, well, I'm not really sure. And I got out of the room as fast as I could. And then I wondered, what happened there? Why was that so unsettling? Why was this simple question uh, from this woman? My patient, why was it so unnerving to be actually asked that question? And as I wrestled with that over the next day or two, it hit me what the problem was. I was a scientist. I was somebody who fancied myself as being pretty rigorous about decision making. You make a decision when you've looked at the evidence, right? I'd never looked at the evidence for this one. I had settled into a sort of comfortable atheism because it was kind of the answer I wanted. And I haven't really, at any point, tried to figure out why believers believe. Now, I assumed that it was all an emotional reaction to some experience they'd had. But I wasn't sure. And I figured I'd better find out. So I went about trying to read something about world religions. And there was no internet, and there was no Wikipedia. <laughs> and let me tell you, it was pretty complicated and confusing, and I had no idea what most of the things I was reading were trying to say about what the fundamentals were of a faith. And so one day in frustration, I knocked on the door of a Methodist minister who lived down the street, who seemed like a reasonable person, and asked him a bunch of probably blasphemous questions. <laughs> and said, I really didn't understand why believers believed. And did you just have to accept this in some sort of blind moment? Or was there some actual evidence that you could point to that said God was at least plausible? And he smiled, and he took a little book off his shelf, 
And he said, why don't you go home and read this? Because it was written by somebody who asked those questions kind of from the same perspective. You know, he was an Oxford scholar, and uh, he was an atheist, and some of his friends were believers, and he was trying to figure out what are they talking about. And ultimately, he got some answers, and he wrote them in this book. Well, that sounded like that might be something that would make sense to me. So I took it home, and I began reading. And I think it was about page four where I realized that all of my arguments against faith were those of a schoolboy, and they lay in utter ruins at the feet of the incredible logic of this thoughtful Oxford scholar who seemed to be able to read my mind, who proposed arguments that rang with the truth, that pointed to the existence of God, not, did not prove it, but pointed to its plausibility, and certainly, well, everybody all right here? <laughs> Maybe that was the final activation of the audio in the other room. I can hope for that, but uh, maybe somebody will let me know if that has happened. Um, that was a little unsettling. So, <laughs> it's the ghost of C.S. Lewis, you see, because that's whose book I was reading. It was C.S. Lewis himself, and the book was Mere Christianity. And this book, if you've not looked at it, is certainly well worth the time uh, to investigate. So what were some of the arguments uh, that Lewis posed and other arguments that came to me about the same time from other directions? Why is it that at that point I began to doubt my own atheism? Well, for starters, I had to admit uh, when it was pointed out that my naturalistic viewpoint, my materialistic viewpoint, if you will, ah, they can hear us. Hello out there. <laughs> we are delighted to have you join us by audio, and we hope you all have not gone home. <laughs> so uh, in, in just a moment, I, I mean, if the people here will tolerate it, let me give a quick rundown of where we've just been, although I know you could see the video. Basically, I've gone through a quick synopsis of where we are with understanding the human genome. And then I've talked a bit about my own personal path towards faith from atheism, and we're just now getting to the, some of the arguments that convinced me to give another look at the idea that faith might actually be a rational choice. I always thought that faith and reason were opposites, and what I learned is that, in fact, reason and faith go together. Faith has an additional element, you could call that revelation, but faith is also profoundly resting upon reason in the path that I discovered. And one of those arguments about the need for a faith perspective is that, in fact, the naturalistic perspective alone leaves one in an impoverished state. Science is certainly the only reliable way to understand how the natural world works. That's what science does. It does it really well. But is that all? Aren't there some questions that you might want to pose that science isn't going to help you with, like why is there something instead of nothing? Why am I here anyway? What happens after I die? Is there a God? Is it not immediately apparent that science has to remain silent on those four questions? And yet, are those not some of the most important questions that any human being ever asks? Do you simply render them uh, irrelevant, decide that they have to be taken off the table, or do you try to find some way to answer them? And if so, science is not going to be the way. Well, that took me, uh, start, uh, caught me short. Furthermore, I began to realize that my own beloved science contained within it pointers to God that could not be ignored, not proofs, mind you, but certainly suggestions that make a strict atheist perspective rather hard to defend. There is something instead of nothing. No reason that should be. Those beloved second-order differential equations, why did they work? <laughs> Why should mathematics be successful in describing how the universe is put together? Uh, anyone who has worked in the field of physics will tell you the experience of first understanding Maxwell's equations is one of those moments of realizing that this is not just mathematical elegance, it, it is beauty. It is so simple, and yet it describes something so complex. And that seems to suggest that the universe is put together by a mathematical mind. Otherwise, why would mathematics be so much <clears throat> in the fabric of the way in which matter and energy behave? The Big Bang. 
Most uh, scientists do agree that the universe had a beginning about 13.7 billion years ago. And at that moment, in an unimaginable flash, a singularity, a matter and energy, were born, began flying apart uh, at great speeds, and ultimately resulted in what we can now measure as the redshift of galaxies and the background radiation uh, as the afterglow of that event. That suggests, in fact, seems to cry out for the conclusion that the universe had a beginning. Uh, how does that happen? We have not watched nature uh, creating itself. That seems to imply that something else outside of nature would have had to do that creating, something that is therefore not subject to those same laws and would not therefore require a creator itself. Otherwise, you've committed an infinite regress problem. So the creator would have to be supernatural, and that sounds like God. And then there's this phenomenally interesting concept, this series of realizations, many of them only discovered in the last 25 or 30 years, that the physical constants that basically determine the way that the universe behaves seem to have these precisely chosen values to make complexity possible. You know about those physical laws, many of them have constants, the speed of light, the gravitational constant, the strong and weak nuclear force, and so on. You cannot derive what the value of those constants are. They just have the value they have. They're givens. People like Barrow and Tipler began looking uh, some time ago just for fun. Suppose they were a little different. Suppose the gravitational constant was just a teeny bit weaker than it is. Well, amazingly, if it were just one part in 10 to the 14th weaker, than its actual value, then after the Big Bang, there would not have been enough gravitational force to result in coalescence of stars, galaxies, planets, and us. It would have been this infinitely diffused, uh, sterile universe without the possibility of anything like life. If the gravitational constant was a tiny bit stronger, then everything would come back together a little too soon, and the Big Bang would be followed by a big crunch. <laughs> Not a pretty picture, because we needed the time, of course, for life to appear, and that time would not have been offered. So here you have a, a really interesting circumstance where this constant, which could have had almost any value you could imagine, happens to have exactly the precise value and a very fine tolerance indeed that makes life possible. And that's just one of about 15 such constants, all of which, if you tinker with them, result in a universe not capable of sustaining any kind of form of life. I'm not just talking about life like we recognize it, but anything that inv involves complexity. And that seems to be a profound challenge uh, to the strict atheist, although there's a way out of it. So let me tell you what the way out is. I mean, basically, you've got two options here. First of all, you cannot say this is just a coincidence. It is too unimaginably unlikely to be just a coincidence. So either, there is an infinite series of parallel universes out there that we cannot measure that have different values of these constants. And of course, we have to live in the one where life is possible or we wouldn't be here having this conversation. Or you have to say that they were actually set on purpose. Now, which of those conclusions requires more faith? Especially when you put it together with the other arguments. It seems to me that you've got something pretty profound here. And when I first encountered that, it blew me away. And then there's this issue about us humans, because notice everything up until this point are arguments about tuning of the universe and mathematics that imply that there's a creator who's a mathematician and who actually was interested in complexity, but it doesn't get you to a theist God, a God who cares about human beings. And here is the argument in Lewis's first chapter that caught me up short, that chapter entitled Right and Wrong as a Clue to the Meaning of the Universe. What is that about? Well, this is the moral law, or the law of right behavior. This is this universal human behavior characteristic property, uh, the knowledge that there is such a thing as right, and there is such a thing as wrong, and that we are called to do the right thing. And if you look down through history, across cultures, across times, you will not find a human population or a human culture that did not have that moral law. They interpreted it often very differently in terms of deciding what was in the right column and what is in the wrong column, but they didn't disagree that there were such columns and that we were supposed to try to do the things that were in the column called right. Where does that come from? Well, various arguments have been brought to bear on this that relate to evolutionary pressures.
Because after all, you can imagine that if you do nice things uh, to other people, maybe they'll do nice things to you and you will be reproductively more successful. <laughs> That's what evolution cares about. Uh, that would be called reciprocal altruism. This is a lot of this is about altruism. And of course, if you're nice to your relatives, they share your DNA, uh, so their reproductive fitness is also a good thing uh, for the DNA that you're carrying. So you can kind of see why being nice to your relatives would also be something evolution would care about. And you can see some manifestations of these things in animals. But what about radical altruism? What about an Oscar Schindler who decides to risk his life to save thousands of Jews from the Holocaust. They're not of his particular tribe, and yet he does this because he feels called to do so. And we, when we hear about it, we don't shake our heads and go, well, that was stupid. No. <laughs> we admire this. We think of this as the most noble kind of action that a human being can take. We wish that we were more like that. We aspire to that. We often fall short, but there's something calling us to do that. Now, evolution would say, that's a scandal. Oscar Schindler is really mixed up here about what his purpose in life is. So is Mother Teresa. So are all these people that have decided to risk their lives in Darfur, trying to save people from a terrible disaster at the very risk of losing their own life in the process. And yet, when we look at that, we think, that's what we should be doing. Where does that come from? Interesting. Now, I'm not going to say any of these arguments are proofs, and if any of these arguments fell apart, my faith would not be shaken. But I hope you will see that these are the kinds of points that can cause a previous atheist like myself to begin to really wonder, what's going on here? And in this case, the moral law, if you want to accept it as something that's not readily explained by purely biological arguments, does seem to be perhaps a signpost and if you were looking for a signpost to the presence of a God, a God who didn't just create the universe in that unimaginable flash, but a God who had a purpose of creating a universe that would allow complexity and life and conscious life and creatures with whom God could have fellowship and interaction, wouldn't this be an interesting place to find that evidence written into all of our hearts, this call to be good and holy? even though we readily fail all the time uh, to live up to it, but we know it's there. And if you're willing to go with me there to the idea that that might be a signpost, it also tells us something profoundly important about God's character, which is that God must be more good and more holy than we can imagine. And of course, this is not a new thought. Here's another example that people have looked at as a radical altruism that's hard to explain and yet one that I think one can admire. This is Dirk Willems. In 1569, Dirk was imprisoned for his faith. Uh, he was kept in a tower, and he was pretty sure that uh, his days were numbered. He managed to escape, and running across a frozen lake, uh, pursued by uh, a guard who saw him running, he was able to get across the lake, but the guard fell through the ice and began calling for help. Now here's Dirk. Freedom is in sight, and what does he do? He recognizes another human being needs help. He turns around. He walks back carefully across the ice and saves the guard from certain death. The guard then arrests him, takes him back to the tower, and four days later, he's executed. Did Dirk do a really bad thing here? No, he did an incredibly generous thing. And you can't hear that story without admiring the idealism and the determination of this person to practice this kind of radical altruism to save another life, even though his own life ultimately was ended as a result. What is that about? I'm not a philosopher, but I will certainly point to the fact that what we've just been talking about here are issues that have amazed and interested philosophers for a long time and uh, certainly including Immanuel Kant. Two things, he said, fill me with constantly increasing admiration and awe. The longer and more earnestly I reflect on them, the starry heavens without and the moral law within. Well, we've just been reflecting on those as well. So those will not bring you to the point of saying, OK, I give up. God has proven to be true. But those over the course of a couple of years of my own personal struggles in my mid-20s, 
helped me to realize that I could no longer sustain uh, a strict atheism, that that was probably the least acceptable of my options. And then I had to figure out, well, what is God like? And then I had to go back and read those world religions, this time with a better foundation of understanding maybe what some of the principles might be behind them. And as I read about them, and I did try to do my own survey of major world religions, I realized that they were, had a lot in common, an incredible amount in common, in terms of undergirding the kinds of things we're called to do, of describing what God is like and what we humans are like. But I encountered this one remarkable person in the midst of all this, and that was the person of Jesus Christ who not only claimed to know God, but to be God, who made this outrageous claim of being able to forgive sins that had been committed by other people to other people, and yet he said he could forgive them, and who also, as far as I could tell, made a claim that one couldn't walk past without uh, basically committing some sort of serious intellectual problem on your own head, as Lewis points out. To say that Christ was simply a great moral teacher is a real problem. Somebody who claims to be the son of God uh, cannot very well be just a great moral teacher unless he really is or unless he's just crazy. So which is it? Ultimately, I also realized that Christ solved for me a profound problem. That as I became more aware of the moral law and more aware of my own shortcomings, I felt that there was God out there representing everything that was good and holy, and I was more and more falling short of that and unable to reach out and find any way to communicate with that God. And yet Christ, who is both man and God, stepped into that gap, provided the bridge that I was missing that allowed me finally to recognize that even in my own imperfections, I could be acceptable because of Christ's blood. And so something like the crucifixion and the resurrection, which for me as an atheist made not any sense at all, suddenly became the solution to a profound personal problem. And so at age 27, while hiking in the Northwest and the Cascade Mountains on a beautiful fall day with my mind cleared of some of those distractions that all too often get in the way of making a real decision, I fell on my knees and became a Christian. And that has been the guiding force of my life. But you will say, OK, you're a believer now. Seems to me by this time you were going into medicine and genetics, and uh, doesn't your head explode? <laughs> I mean, isn't evolution incompatible with faith? Well, here is, I think, the crux of what I think bedevils many people coming at this question, either from a faith perspective or a science perspective or both. And that's where we're going to spend a little time, and then we're going to get to the questions. But I thought it would be interesting for you to see an example of how a really aggressive questioner uh, approaching this question about evolution and faith uh, has tackled it. So with your permission, uh, we'll actually watch uh, by video such an interaction between, well, probably the most aggressive questioner that you can imagine. Well, what about that? Whoa. <laughs> you know, when I went uh, to be on that show, I'm sort of trembling in the green room waiting to be introduced to the host, figuring that we're going to have a little conversation before we do this in front of millions of people. And so he comes out to the green room in character. He says, oh, are you Collins? And I say, yes. <laughs> and he says, very short little comment, I'm going to get you. You're going to go down. <laughs> That was it. <laughs> that was the entire conversation. So, so a very fresh interview there. Well, well, I think Colbert, who is just the absolute master at kind of uh, the quick comeback, but also likes science a lot. If you watch his show, you'll see he brings scientists on there with fair regularity, because uh, I think he realizes it's a chance to put science in front of an audience that probably isn't paying much attention to it otherwise. <laughs> so. But some of the things he, that came up in that silly argument, we could now take on uh, in a little bit more seriousness, because I do want to, uh, before we get to the questions, try to lay out how it is that I think in a very straightforward way, one can put together the theory of evolution, a theory which one can say is a theory in the same sense that gravity is a theory, because it is so well supported now, uh, with a belief in a creator God. <clears throat> 
So what's the evidence for the theory? Well, one is the fossil record. The fossil record will always have gaps because most organisms leave, leave no traces of their having been here. But there have been some dramatic examples in the last few years of supposed gaps in the fossil record that are actually being filled. Here is one, uh, Tiktaalik, uh, this remarkable animal that seems to be partly land and partly aquatic, uh, representing uh, an animal that has four limbs that are partly like fins and partly like something that could move on land. A very interesting uh, observation. But I would say, actually, that most of the more recent evidence supporting Darwin's theory of evolution comes from the study of DNA. If Darwin, back uh, 150 years ago, had tried to imagine uh, what kind of proof might come along for his theory, he might have thought of a time machine, because that would be helpful. Uh, I don't know whether he would have thought of DNA, because nobody had a clue what that stuff was that controlled heredity. But this, in fact, turns out to be uh, a beautifully digital demonstration of the way in which evolution occurs, namely by gradual change, mutations in DNA, uh, acted upon by natural selection over very, very long periods of time. So if you take the DNA, not just of ourselves, but of lots of other organisms, and you determine its sequence, and we've done this now for more than three dozen uh, vertebrates, and you place them in order, basically, uh, depending upon the similarities of their DNA sequences, this is what you get. Uh, this is a tree uh, that uh, represents uh, those similarities. And what do you know? It matches extremely well with the tree that has been previously put together based upon anatomic similarities on the one hand and the fossil record on the other. So there's a remarkable consistency here. Now, those who are not comfortable with evolution as the answer, who would rather see that this is a result of multiple acts of special creation by God, who basically used the same motifs uh, for these various organisms with minor changes, would say, and I think could accurately say, that that would still give you this same pattern. This does not demonstrate absolutely without a shadow of a doubt that there is a common ancestor down here. But other things that we've learned uh, basically make that alternative you know, almost impossible to support. And so let me point out that this applies not just to other organisms, but to ourselves. And a particularly compelling example comes from all places, human chromosome 2. And it comes from looking at human chromosome 2 compared to our closest relative, the chimpanzee, whose genome sequence we also have now at a fairly high level of accuracy. If you look at the human chromosomes under the microscope and compare them to the chimpanzee, they look very similar. This is a a drawing of what they would look like. The human has 22 of the so-called autosomes and then the sex chromosomes X and Y. The chimpanzee has chromosomes that look very much the same in terms of size and banding pattern with one exception, which is over here, where human chromosome 2 does not seem to have a similar chromosome in the chimp or, in fact, in the gorilla. But if you look closely at the banding pattern, and people have stared at that uh, for uh, many decades, it looks as if perhaps if you put those two together, sort of head to head, you might end up with that. Well, now that we have the sequence, we can actually examine that hypothesis. And I need to tell you something important about chromosomes. Chromosomes have at their very tips, the so-called telomeres of all of these, a special DNA sequence that only happens at the telomeric tips. Now, if, in fact, there had been a recent fusion of two chromosomes to make one, you might expect there would be a footprint of that, namely the appearance of those telomeric sequences in the middle of a chromosome where they don't belong. Well, what do you know? When you look carefully at human chromosome 2, you discover sequences here indicated by these colored balls, which do, in fact, represent telomeric sequences and in fact, you can see that the specific form of those is exactly what is traveling in the chimpanzee in those two smaller chromosomes. So we now have evidence not just from indirect observation of banding patterns, but from specific DNA sequences that make it inescapable in the view of those who've looked at this data carefully that in fact there was an ancient fusion probably sometime in the neighborhood of four million years ago which brought together those two chromosomes, leaving the evidence of their fusion point uh, in these specific DNA sequences, which we find there and find in nowhere else in the human genome. They shouldn't be there. They will probably, over the next oh, five or six million years, if we're lucky enough to be around, uh, gradually uh, disappear because they were not being so subject to any particular selection. They're not performing any function. But they're there now as evidence of this step.
That makes it very difficult to postulate that humans and chimps are not descended from a common ancestor. The common ancestor presumably had this version, since gorillas also have that version. There are other uh, examples. Uh, one other quick one is the existence of pseudogenes. Uh, pseudogenes are, in fact, uh, genes that once apparently had a function but have acquired a number of lethal flaws that render them no longer functioning. Now, when you look around our genome or that of a mouse or a dog or a cat or a cow, you will find quite a lot of these. And a particularly interesting circumstance, of course, is when you find the human has a gene that was once active in other species. And here's a circumstance uh, that is uh, particularly interesting. If you look across human, chimp, and dog as three possible uh, organisms whose sequence we have in front of us, and if you find the order of three genes as A, B, and C, you will often find that order is preserved in other organisms in the mammalian lineage. That in itself suggests a common ancestor, but doesn't prove it. But occasionally, you'll find a circumstance where the human gene is a pseudogene. It's sustained a knockout blow. It's no longer functioning. It has a lethal flaw. But the chimp and the dog will still have that gene functioning. Now, that is a great puzzle unless you're going to postulate a common ancestor. If God, in fact, had created the human genome independently as an act of special creation, why would God have placed in this very position a non-functioning gene? So for both this case and the chromosome 2 case, I think it becomes extremely difficult to avoid the conclusion that we are descended from a common ancestor as are other living things. The alternative requires you to place God in the position of being a bit of a charlatan, of actually having put information into the genome to purposefully mislead us into drawing a conclusion that's not in fact correct. And that does not sound like the God that I worship. Now, I know I'm getting into territory here, which for some of you will be uncomfortable. And my role here is really to tell you what I, as a scientist and a believer, have learned about science and what I have learned about my belief in the context of that, and vice versa. And I'm going to come to a point here shortly where I think these things can be put quite comfortably together. But for those who are basically resting their faith upon the idea you know, that humans are not part of this evolutionary a tapestry, uh, there is a serious issue to be dealt with in terms of what the data will show when it's subjected to close scrutiny. So how can we reconcile evolution and faith then? Well, some, amongst my colleagues especially, have in fact decided that you can't and you shouldn't and they're not interested in trying and that of course carries me back to where I was uh, 25 years ago as an atheist, perhaps one of the strongest voices comes out of the evolutionary biology community, namely Richard Dawkins, uh, whose book, The God Delusion, is one of those few that does not require a subtitle to know what he's talking about. <laughs> and Dawkins, in this book, uh, in very strong language, uh, basically ridicules religion as having any possible connection to reason, and also argues that religion is the greatest source of evil uh, in the world and basically at one point argues that parents who raise their children in a religious tradition are committing child abuse and should be pr prosecuted for it. Uh, strong words indeed. Now, atheism is a problem, and I, th I think we've tried to touch upon that already, because atheism, as Chesterton says, is the most daring of all dogmas, the assertion of a universal negative. With all of those pointers to God, and all of those questions that science has to remain silence on, uh, silent on, including is there a God, it seems this is the least rational of all positions that a thinking person could take. And if you want to see more about how that debate played out in the pages of, of Time Magazine, this is still up on the web, a debate that Dawkins and I had about a year and a half ago, uh, God versus Science, uh, where he proposed very much the atheist position. But interestingly, at the end of that debate, if you go and read it, uh, you will see that he opens the door a crack uh, in that I pressed him a bit on how it is that from a scientific perspective he could exclude something that was outside of nature when science is limited to the exploration of natural things. And he said, well, you know, I wouldn't exclude the possibility there might be something so grand and so unimaginably complex and mysterious and beyond our ability to understand uh, that we might not be able to discover it by scientific method. 
And I said, well, then you just got it, because that's the kind of God I'm talking about. The problem is, so many times, I think those who decry faith on the basis of science uh, misrepresent what faith is all about. I don't recognize the faith that Richard Dawkins talks about. I don't know what faith he's describing. It's certainly not that of a mature believer. A second possibility, and a, a chapter that I traveled through, agnosticism, is, I suppose, an honorable position to basically say, I don't know. I, it's not possible to know. But I would say that this is only a principled position if the agnostic has considered all of the evidence for and against God and found it unconvincing. And in my experience, many agnostics are agnostics simply because they don't want to think about it. And that's a little different. And so I would encourage you, after all, these are amongst the most important questions that we humans ever ask. If you are an agnostic, have you really looked at that evidence and found it inconvincing? Or is it still lying ahead of you to do that? Option three, and one which is very prevalent in this country, is creationism, particularly young earth creationism. The US Gallup poll conducted recently asked these questions uh, of what people's beliefs were and gave three possibilities of how human beings came to be. I'll show you the percentages of what the answers were to these three choices. The largest percentage, 45%, uh, signed on to the idea that God created human beings in their present form within the last 10,000 years. You can go to a creation museum outside Cincinnati that is a manifestation in a museum form of that belief, including humans frolicking with dinosaurs and many other things. <laughs> this is... This is really quite startling uh, in a country that pr uh, prides itself on advances in science and technology. You cannot get to young earth creationism without throwing out the fundamental principles of geology, of biology, of chemistry, of physics, of cosmology, of paleontology. All of those ologies uh, really can't be tweaked around the edges to result in an earth that's 6,000 years old. And again, I say that recognizing that there are many people who have been led to believe that this is the only acceptable position for a sincere Christian, and that if you back away from this, you are starting then to dilute all the truths of the Bible, and ultimately you will lose your faith. And I think that is a terrible story that has been conveyed, uh, oftentimes in Sunday schools or from the pulpit, and particularly to young people who must, as they begin to look at the data that undergirds the other arguments about the age of the earth, I conclude that either science or faith is terribly wrong, and many of them, in my experience, walk away from both. And this is a wholly unnecessary situation. I can tell you the young earth creationist perspective is largely an invention of the last 130 years. If you go back and read that history, it is a very interesting one, and it is clear that much of this has been a reaction rather than a positive step, a reaction to evolution, a reaction to a sense that materialism was getting the upper hand, and there had to be some sort of recourse for believers to tie into. But this is not a good place, I think, to, to, to connect your wagon. There's a recent uh, uh, pamphlet just produced by the National Academy of Sciences uh, by a very thoughtful group uh, chaired by Francesco Ayala, uh, who is both a scientist of evolution and a uh, Catholic priest, uh, who goes through the arguments about science, evolution, and creationism in a very thoughtful way. And here's what I think uh, ought to be emblazoned, I suppose, on all of the church programs and Sunday school doorways in circumstances where we are running up into unnecessary collisions between perspectives. St. Augustine, probably the greatest theologian in my view, uh, in terms of a trying to understand what Genesis was all about. Genesis, of course, being the place that many people find to be a stumbling block in accepting evolution. Augustine wrote five separate books on the interpretation of Genesis with trying out various ideas about what those verses meant and ultimately came up with this particular conclusion, which is really appropriate for today in matters that are so obscure, he says, and far beyond our vision. We find in Holy Scripture passages which can be interpreted in very different ways without prejudice to the faith we have received. In such cases, we should not rush in headlong and so firmly take our stand on one side that if further progress in the search for truth justly undermines this position, we too fall with it. So he's advocating to be careful. When you have interpretation possibilities, and it is not clear what the real meaning of a verse is, to attach yourself to a single view and say, that's what you have to believe in order to be a real Christian, 
is to, in fact, put the faith at risk because science may come along and prove you wrong, and then what have you done? You've made God too small. We don't have to worry that somehow science which is investigating nature that God created, is somehow going to be a threat to God. And yet sometimes it seems as if believers are taking that perspective. So creationism, while it is embraced by many in this country, is, I'm afraid, in a circumstance that is headed for deep trouble in the coming years. Intelligent design uh, arrived on the scene, perhaps only about 15 years ago, and one of its main champions uh, here at Berkeley, Philip Johnson, arguing that, in fact, okay, uh, evolution may have some value here in terms of the ability of organisms to change over time, but what about all of those very complex things you find in organisms that evolution doesn't seem to be able to create with, a, with any kind of reasonable probability? So here are the foundational premises of intelligent design. An interesting and much misunderstood perspective, but one which, from my view, also suffers from a fatal flaw. Intelligent design basically was a reaction uh, to evolution and its apparent atheistic worldview, and therefore the need to resist it in some way. The argument is that evolution is fundamentally flawed because it can't account for certain instances of complexity, and those, that complexity therefore calls out for an intelligent designer who stepped in to provide the necessary components in some sort of historical time. Well, this is clearly a problem, this complexity that bothered Darwin as well. And he says in The Origin of Species, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. But what's the next sentence? But I can find out no such case, says Darwin. And here in 2008, we can still find out no such case, despite the position taken by intelligent design advocates, such as the Discovery Institute. Favorite examples of irreducible complexity are put forward. The eye, what an amazing organ. By the way, the eye has been independently derived by evolution at least seven times. If you look through all of the things we're learning about all these organisms, the eye has come into being by independent means at least seven different times. It's almost like it is such a strong, compelling, positive attribute that you can't stop it from popping up over and over again. The clotting cascade, uh, the way in which uh, blood clots, a very elaborate cascade indeed, and perhaps the most famous example, the bacterial flagellum. So what's the argument that ID proposes? Here is a model of the bacterial flagellum. It sits in an E. coli here. It's like a little outboard motor that allows this bacterium to swim around. And it has this amazing engineering capability to it. It is nanotechnology in a marvelous way, where it has all of these various parts. And if you knock out any single one of these parts, all of which are proteins, then the thing doesn't work anymore. So and on the surface of it, it looks like this is an impossibly complicated thing for evolution to have created. It takes 32 different components before the thing works. So would evolution have to somehow develop all 32 of them before any advantage was derived? And that couldn't possibly happen. The probabilities would be much too low. And that's basically, in a nutshell, although I don't mean to oversimplify it, a lot of what the arguments of ID come down to, that these complicated, multi-component, uh, my, uh, marvelous engineering efforts uh, could not possibly have been derived by a simple evolutionary mechanism of mutation followed by natural selection. The problem is that it assumes that this came into being out of nothing. And in fact, as documented in a recent paper in Nature Review's Microbiology, we are now learning a lot about the bacterial flagellum. And if you look at those individual protein components, many of them now, uh, two pages worth uh, of table in this article, are shown to have independent origins in other kinds of functions. And then you begin to see the flagellum didn't happen out of nowhere. It was gradually built up bit by bit by recruiting proteins that were doing other somewhat similar things. And ultimately, again, with very long periods of time and natural selection to drive the process, resulting in what we now see today as truly a marvelous contraption that you can't quite imagine how it came to be. But now we can imagine and can see those steps in front of us. So Dembski, one of the other uh, strong proponents of ID, uh, wrote a few years ago in a defense of ID, and I think it's a very credible way to respond, and I give him a lot of credit for saying it so clearly. If it could be shown that biological systems that are wonderfully complex, elegant, and integrated, such as the bacterial flagellum, could have been formed by a gradual Darwinian process, 
and thus that their specified complexity is an illusion. Then intelligent design would be refuted on the general grounds that one does not invoke intelligent causes when undirected natural causes will do. Most of us looking at the story of the flagellum and many others would say that time has arrived. And intelligent design for all of its attractiveness as a defense against atheistic evolution and therefore being embraced by many churches is in fact a God of the gaps theory. It's a theory that says, here's something we can't quite explain with current knowledge. That must be where God has acted. Those theories have not fared well down through history. Uh, this one is not going to fare well either. So how do we put this together? Well, I'm going to finally come to what I think is a synthesis that I have found enormously comforting, satisfying, enriching over the course of the last 30 years. And those 40% of working scientists who are also believers, many of whom belong to an organization I belong to called the American Scientific Affiliation, uh, also, uh, for the most part, uh, embrace this particular view, which goes by the fairly uh, difficult to understand name, theistic evolution. And here it is in a, in a simple description. And here's what I believe. Almighty God, who is not limited in space or time, created a universe 13.7 billion years ago with its parameters precisely tuned to allow the development of complexity over long periods of time. God's plan included the mechanism of evolution. That was his creative genius, to create the marvelous diversity of living things on our planet. And that included most especially human beings. After evolution over this long period of time had prepared a sufficiently advanced house, the human brain, with all of its uh, neurological complexity, then God gifted humanity with something special that makes us different from all the animals, the knowledge of good and evil, the moral law, with free will, which is not an illusion, and with the soul. We humans used our free will to break the moral law. That's what the story of Adam and Eve is all about leading to our estrangement from God. For Christians like me, Jesus is the solution to that estrangement. That's it. That is a simple way of putting together what seems in many people's view to be a terribly difficult dilemma. And yet I find no reason as a scientist or as a believer to object uh, to that synthesis uh, in either detail or in the larger view. And let me point out that again, I made a case here about the moral law as an indication of our connection to God. If the moral law, as evolutionists who are atheists would argue, is just a side effect of evolution, then where does that take us? That says there really is no such thing as right or wrong or good or evil. It's all an illusion. We've all been hoodwinked by natural selection into thinking that there is such a thing. Are any of us, including the strong atheists, really prepared to live our lives within that worldview? If that were true, where does Richard Dawkins get off saying religion is evil? There's no such thing as evil, right? Why should we worry about it? We've all just been talked into something, and we should rise above it, Richard, and decide that, in fact, we're no longer going to be subject to this evolutionary illusion. Think about it. I think this is a fairly profound consequence of the atheistic worldview that most have not fully uh, absorbed. Well, theistic evolution is not a great term. It leaves a lot to be desired. It sounds as if theistic is sort of an afterthought and evolution is the main point, and most people haven't really quite been sure for a long time what a theist is in any way. So I would like to suggest an alternative way to describe this synthesis, which is life bios through the word, as in John 1, in the beginning was the word, the logos. The logos is God speaking into being all of us, or simply biologos. And I like the way this sort of makes everything fall together. If it is life through God speaking us into being, then that DNA that I get to study every day in a certain way is God's language, hence the title of this book, and that provides us as scientists with an opportunity when we make a discovery about genetics or anything else for that matter, to be getting a little glimpse of God's mind. For me as a scientist, that makes the process of discovery infinitely more exciting than it would be if I was an atheist. Now there are objections uh, to BioLogos. Maybe we'll get into some of those in the questions. 
uh, from people who are more of the conservative Christian view. Evolution, uh, some would argue, violates the second law. In fact, it doesn't, but we could talk about that if people are troubled. I already mentioned how do you put this together with Genesis. Augustine would say, let's be careful not to attach one interpretation to that particular part of the Bible because it's really hard to know what was intended. There's the whole question about physical death and does the Bible indicate there was no physical death before Eden and that's impossible to reconcile with the fossil record. And who were Adam and Eve? Were they literal characters? And what really happened at the fall? And how should we interpret the flood? And then perhaps more philosophically, did God just wind up the clock by starting the evolutionary process or has God been somehow intervening along the way, maybe not in the ID sort of fashion, but in other ways that God has inhabited his creation? Can you account for miracles, especially if you're a scientist? And as I tried to address, can't evolutionary forces explain the moral law? These are all good questions. They have answers. Perhaps we'll get into them in the discussion. They're all addressed in one way or another uh, in the book and many other sources that one can look at uh, for this kind of perspective. So I come back to this. One of the great tragedies, I think, of our time, in this country especially, is that people are being led to believe that you have to choose one or the other. We hear the shrill voices of atheists on the one hand, oftentimes using evolution and the science of evolution as a club over the head of believers, insisting that if you accept evolution, then you have to give up on God. On the other hand, we have fundamentalists on the other side of this arguing that science is in fact dangerous, that you can't trust the findings from science, and that you have to walk away from those or you're not being a sincere believer. Most of us don't live at those extremes, and yet they have been dominating the stage lately in books that fill our shelves and airwaves uh, with conversations. I don't want to live in a country in the future where one of these has to triumph and the other has to fail, because I think we will be impoverished if we are not both creatures who can use science to understand nature and use it to improve the, the, the lot of humankind, and also use our spiritual nature to understand those eternal questions and draw closer to each other and to God. And so I would hope uh, that those of you here and those of you in the other room uh, have a chance uh, through the course of this discussion to see a path forward, if you've been troubled about this, uh, towards a way of putting these things together. I can find God in a cathedral, but I can find God in the laboratory. I can read about God in the Bible. I can read about God in the genome. God's truth cannot be in some conflict with God's truth. We have the book of the Bible and we have the book of nature. And they're both, in my view, books that God put in front of us, expected us to pay attention to, and in fact uh, is in a certain way worshiped as we begin to undertake explorations in either of those spheres. And so, to conclude, and then we'll get into the questions, uh, I would hope that as the uh, years go on here, we could find a way to bring together open-minded theologians, open-minded scientists, and some pastors to keep us from getting too academic, and try to come up with a theology of celebration, to celebrate what science is teaching us about our remarkable universe instead of feeling threatened by it, because I'm quite sure that God is not threatened by what our puny minds have been discovering about his creation. Thank you all very much. Wow, thank you, Francis. Let me get the glasses here. Ah. Well, now we have an opportunity for two more small events before we clear out in about 45 minutes or so. Uh, the first involves one of our dear friends and colleagues, a faculty member on the Berkeley campus, who will have a few moments uh, on the stage to interview Dr. Collins. And then, of course, we'll be entertaining the questions that come from you on those little cards and a reminder to those ushers in Dwinell to make sure those cards uh, get passed in so that we can get them over here in a timely fashion. Well, our discussion leader tonight is another extraordinary scholar, and Dr. Jasper Rhine is a professor uh, of genetics and development here at UC Berkeley. Dr. Rhine also grew up on a farm 
his time in upstate New York. By the way, those of you that don't know, it's a general principle that great scholars come from those places where they raised large farm animals. <laughs> it's a well-known truth, at least in chemical engineering. Uh, Dr. Ryan uh, received his PhD in, in molecular genetics from the University of Oregon and joined the Berkeley faculty here in, in 1982. Uh, his research has focused on the molecular biology of baker's yeast, and Dr. Ryan has helped uh, organize the project to map the dog genome. Uh, like Professor Collins, Professor Ryan has uh, received many accolades and awards, and it's particularly touching that it is extremely difficult to find anything written about the awards for Professor Ryan, uh, a measure of his humility, which I respect a great deal. But uh, he has many awards and accomplishments to his name, not the least of which is being named a fellow uh, of the American Academy of Microbiology. Uh, many of you students might know that Professor Ryan also received the UC Berkeley Distinguished Teaching Award in 1997, and that's the highest award bestowed on Berkeley faculty for their teaching. In 2006, Professor Ryan was named a Howard Hughes Medical Professor, uh, also one of the highest honors accorded for teaching in the biomedical sciences. Professor Ryan, please come to the stage. Uh, well, thank you. Let me first check and see if the microphone is working. Is it, is it working? Okay. Well, Francis, I've admired you for many years, but the ability to come to a draw against Stephen Colbert is yet one more list of accomplishments <laughs> that I could never imagine equal. You're too kind. <laughs> So I'm sensing there's a, a large amount of uh, desire to ask questions from the audience. So I'd like to keep my portion of the show uh, short. And I want to direct our discussion briefly, at least, to two of the core components of your arguments for a belief in, in God and in faith. And as I see these, these are the, uh, the anthropic principle and the moral law are two of the foundations of your argument. Mm -hmm. So if we could deal with the moral law first. Live there. Let's see if that works better. Is it better? I think it's under your tongue instead of on top. Let's try that. Is that better? Mm. Oh. <laughs> Maybe hold it. <laughs> and we'll try that. Is that working? All right. So let's deal with the moral law. Uh, so those of us that have had a close association with large farm animals or, or household pets, uh, would have a hard time believing that morality has been excluded completely from animals. Mm -hmm. Though we would all agree that there's a quantitative difference between what we observe in humans versus what we observe in, in, in animals. So would there be observations that could be made from animal behavior or a study of, of, of animals in nature that would temper your conviction that the moral law might be something that's uniquely human? So it's... Ooh. It's a great question, and uh, again, this gets into an interesting intersection uh, between biology, evolution, and moral philosophy, uh, because it requires you to decide what really is an evidence of moral behavior as opposed to some other related behavior, such as displaying empathy. I think we do have evidence from experimentation and Franz Duval has done a lot of this with primates, that animals, uh, primates, and it, certainly dogs, uh, even mice, are capable of demonstrating something that looks like empathy at the suffering of another animal of their same species. Or for instance, there are experiments where a, a monkey will avoid uh, delivering a shock to a companion, even if that's going to provide uh, uh, some food benefit. So there is something there that has some relationship to moral behavior. And I'm not a philosopher, but I think most moral philosophers would say that's not the whole thing. You don't really have a full-blown sense of morality unless you also bring judgment and reason uh, into the picture. And it is not clear that judgment and reason are participating in these other animal demonstrations. Again, I don't think I'm particularly shaken up by the idea that evolution would have provided some of the neurological hardware necessary for building a foundation that could become, in us humans, something we call the moral law, which has all of these other components to it, uh, it would make sort of sense, in fact, that you wouldn't have to 
invent this uh, in some supernatural way out of a uh, whole cloth, but that you would want to provide some components of this along the way, just as you'd want to provide components for consciousness, for the ability to have free will, and so on. But I, I come back to the fact that the moral law uh, glimmers that one sees in animals do not rise to the level of this scandalous kind of radical altruism, which seems to me to be the strongest indication that there's something going on here that evolution alone cannot fully explain about human spirit and human nature. Uh, not a proof, uh, just a, a cause for serious thought and something that very serious thinkers have been wrestling with. And I would say if you encounter sociobiologists uh, who are arguing that this is a solved problem, that's just not the case. There's some very interesting explorations going on, but it's not the case. You've made a good argument that pure altruism doesn't fit with classic evolutionary theory when you're saving a genome that's not related to your own. Right. Would you entertain cultural evolution as being a foundation for the origin of, of altruism where the first culture that stumbles upon this behavior by accident has increased fitness as a culture and our evolutionary principles would then apply. Right, so this then gets us into the question of what is the unit upon which evolution operates? Is it the individual or is it the group? And uh, recently after sort of the individual having great prominence in evolutionary theory, the group is sort of making a comeback but that's largely based upon some very interesting game theory uh, approaches uh, that people like Martin Nowak at Harvard uh, have been pursuing. Interestingly, Martin Nowak, uh, the author of these game theories, is also a very serious believer and doesn't think that they undercut this at all, but some of his uh, readers seem to think it does. Basically, game theory, uh, sort of like the prisoner's dilemma, only more complicated, arguing that a group that behaves in a certain altruistic way together may long-term benefit in terms of their survival. Um, there's a problem with that, though, because if this is the case, then the group, by definition, also has to, while supporting the members of the group, also try not uh, to support people who are outside the group. In fact, need to behave belligerently towards people outside the group, or the whole thing falls apart. And our examples of radical altruism are exactly that where the altruism is extended to people way outside the group, and yet we still see that as noble, as admirable, as something that we should all try to do. It falls apart in that situation. In your work, you, you argue quite eloquently against uh, believers relying upon a belief in God to explain gaps in human knowledge, mm -hmm. that because as these gaps become filled, then the foundations of faith are, are, are questioned. And you've raised the issue in the anthropic principle about the imponderable in or improbability of the events that happened in the first 10 to the minus 45th seconds of the universe. Yeah. But aren't we at risk of thinking that as a God in the gaps argument? Sure. I mean, wouldn't Newton have perhaps not entertained the quantum world? And do you worry that the physicists of the future will have an understanding of that that we won't have? I would worry about that. I mean, there's some possibility, uh, one would not want to rule this out on first principles, that somehow, theoretically, it will be possible to show that the constants just have to have the value they do on theoretical basis, not just because they do. Or that they're connected with each other in some way, uh, that there's not 15 of them that are independent. Maybe there's only three, and maybe those three could, in fact, in some way be derived. I don't see that coming. I mean, we have uh, experts in this audience. Charles Towns, the Nobel laureate, is here. It'd be fun to have that conversation with him. Uh, but I, I don't think it's likely uh, that we'll fill that gap. But I, I take your point uh, very much, Jasper. We have to be careful with any of these arguments coming out of nature to hang your faith on it and say, ah, that's it. That's the one that proves that God must be real. That's always going to be a bit of a risk. But on the other hand, you can take these various observations, one after the other, and they can certainly cause you to think about whether a strong atheist position is defensible. And I think it really starts to crumble pretty quickly when you look at the accumulation of these arguments, no single one of which is sufficient, I think, to get your attention. But you put them all together, and they do have your attention. But let me make something very clear, because maybe you've gotten the impression from this conversation that faith is something one can arrive at by an absolutely, completely intellectual pathway without the element of making a decision to believe. That's not my view. You really do, you could bring yourself all the way to the edge of that leap, but you still have to make a decision based upon incomplete evidence about whether you're going to believe or not. 
And that is something every person has to encounter, and I hope every person will encounter, uh, because oftentimes we put that off, not quite knowing uh, how to face up to it, to the uncertainty that it brings. What I can say is having taken that leap, that what I found afterwards uh, was an enormous source of comfort and joy. And that wasn't necessarily what I expected. I was terrified. So some years ago in California, most of the voters decided in favor of Proposition 73 for putting a lot of taxpayers' money into support of basic science on stem cells with the hope that regenerative medicine will come from that. And of course, depending upon one's approach to stem cell biology, that runs counter to some people's faiths, but not to others. Yeah. Can we see a future in which politics and policy can allow each institution to follow its own public and local prescriptions and let the institutional review boards decide what's okay in one place and what's not okay in another? And why should one faith have the opportunity to trump other faiths on something that could be of benefit to, to all? So certainly the stem cell history is not a pretty one. If you wanted to sort of take a case example uh, where we had a very difficult time uh, getting the scientific facts of the matter in front of the decision makers, this is it. Uh, there was enormous confusion about the difference uh, between somatic cell nuclear transfer, for instance, and the generation of embryos uh, from the formation of an embryo from sperm and egg. And there's, I think, profoundly interesting and significant moral differences uh, between those two entities, and yet they all got lumped together. Uh, I'm not all that optimistic, actually, that in our particular society, that kind of local control is likely to happen with an issue that has the emotional power of the issue of when does human life begin. And I will say, although I think the stem cell uh, situation uh, has been really very unfortunate in terms of the inability to come to some thoughtful conclusions based upon the scientific facts, I do think scientists bear some responsibility as well uh, for all of these discussions going badly or going well. We, as scientists, we have information. It's up to us uh, to contribute that. We can't go in the lab and say, well, it's somebody else's problem to sort it out. And Jasper, I know you're very willing to get into the public uh, square and talk about what science can tell us and what it can't. And I think all of us as scientists need to do that. I will also say, though, that scientists, whether we like to admit it or not, we do have a conflict of interest. We like to do science. <laughs> and we're, in general, going to try to push science forward because it's what we do. We're curious. We're driven by this. And there has to be societal input in some of those very delicate situations where there may be uh, serious reasons to question whether a line should be crossed or not. I wish we could do it more effectively. I wish we could have more people in the policy arena who are trained scientifically to be able to interpret these uh, issues, but I'm not sure we're going to be able to get away uh, from these uh, tumultuous situations when they arise, when something new comes along that seems to threaten particularly the concept of what is human life and when does it begin. We can try harder the next time. I sure hope we will do better. Well, I'll close with, with two other questions. One has to do with sort of the progression of the evolution of life, because we're at the brink of a time when we can actually create our own life forms. And it's highly likely in the next five years, somebody in the Bay Area or Boston will create. You guys are doing that here, right? Exactly. Do you see this as potentially creating another conflict, an unnecessary conflict between science and religion? And is there something that we could do now to head off that conflict if it's going to happen? You know, Jasper, this is a really interesting area because for me, as somebody who studies DNA and uh, simple organisms like E. coli and other bacteria, the idea that it would be theologically significant uh, to take what we already know to be the DNA sequence of a microorganism and synthesize that in the laboratory, that just doesn't seem like it's surprising or even all that interesting. And yet, I think when people who are not involved in this part of science hear about, oh my God, they're synthesizing life, and it might be possible to put that genome that you made in the lab into some environment and get it to jumpstart a self-replicating organism, this seems profound. And this is one of those circumstances where you have a real disconnect between the familiarity that scientists may have with this and the unfamiliarity that non-scientists do. Um, I think if there's an issue here, a lot of it is actually about, I think that must be a time signal, uh, must be about actually safety. And if we have the ability to synthesize organisms, 
what are we going to start making and are we sure that what we're making is going to turn out to be beneficial and not harmful and we don't at the present time have necessarily the right controls uh, to assess that. Well with that audio signal as a clue, <laughs> I'll turn the rest of the program yeah. over to uh, the questions from the audience which will be directed by, by Professor Reimer. Thank you Francis. Thank you Jasper. Thank you very much, Jasper. Appreciate that very much. Now is your opportunity uh, to ask uh, Dr. Collins a question. There's two microphones, uh, one up there uh, by Ansi, and the other is up here in front of me. And uh, uh, Professor Co Dr. Collins will take answer questions uh, from the audience, as well as we have some handwritten questions that will be showing up shortly from Dwinell. Who would like to ask the first question? Um, so, I, you know, I, I found a couple things pretty profound in, in, your, in your book, and uh, I just wanted to ask, you know, where we might be headed. Um, with just a, a general thought of, you know, someone like Galileo back when he first proposed heliocentric, uh, you know, uh, solar system, excuse me, solar system, uh, you know, it was really heavily denounced by the church in, in the same vein that evolution is being denounced nowadays and, and fought. And, uh, you know, taking that with also with the proverb that says is, it is not good to have zeal without knowledge. Um, I, I'm, I wonder where you see us as a society in the next, you know, 100, 200 years. Do you see that eventually we'll, we'll, the church will accept it and, you know, it'll live in harmony and then we'll find something else to argue about? Um, 200 years. Okay, thanks uh, for the question. So... Galileo is a good example to look at. I mean, there is a circumstance where there seemed to be, in some people's minds, an incontrovertible conflict between what science was saying and what they interpreted scripture saying in verses that said, for instance, that the earth shall not be moved. Uh, and it, now we look back on that and think, well, you know, that was really an unnecessarily strict interpretation of a verse that really wasn't trying to teach you anything about science. It was trying to teach you something uh, more significant about what, what God is like. Could we manage to achieve that same synthesis in a happy way uh, with evolution? I think we can. Uh, I think it's absolutely possible. And I think maybe I'm feeling a little more encouraged in the last couple of years about this. In a certain way, the atheist manifestos, the angry pronouncements of Dawkins and Hitchens and Dennett and Harris have activated people to go, now wait a minute, that can't be the answer. There must be some other way here. I don't like that particular view any better than I like the people who are thumping the Bibles and saying science is dangerous. So maybe we have a chance. Uh, it's going to take some real leadership on the part of the scientific community, on the part of the church community, to be able to say, let's sit down together and ask, what is true? Let's admit that we're interested in truth. Let's admit that God can't be threatened by truth. And let's see how we can put this together. I had a very interesting conversation with Rick Warren, who's one of the most uh, well-known evangelical uh, pastors, uh, just two weeks ago. And he seems actually quite open to the idea of having this kind of a conversation. And if we could, as I mentioned very briefly, try to bring together those kinds of leaders and develop a view of how God's creation adds to our sense of awe as we learn more about it, rather than somehow threatening uh, God's existence, uh, that would be a real good step forward. It's not going to happen overnight. There's so many entrenched perspectives here. But maybe in 10 or 20 years, I hope it's not 100, uh, we could actually find our way forward to an embrace of the scientific and the spiritual worldview all at once, because that is the truth. And if we deprive ourselves of one or the others of those, uh, we've really done great harm. Yes, sir. Um, I remember when you were describing your version of theistic evolution, um, you had this idea that after the, the human body and brain had evolved to a sufficient point, God infused a soul with free will and moral sensibilities mm -hmm. into that. Um, I just, I thought that represented a kind of strange kind of sudden rupture um, in the development of things. And I mean, I wouldn't, 
I'd be the first to say that, you know, there's probably something to human beings beyond their purely physical uh -huh. makeup. Uh -huh. But do you think, I don't want to sound too I don't know, weird or new agey here. Maybe there's something, <laughs> do you think there might be it. something kind of a s spiritual dimension to non-human animals? Or do you think they're, I mean, humans being more biologically complex provide a, just a greater outlet for mm -hmm. a spiritual dimension? No, I think you're asking good questions. And again, I didn't mean to imply that this sort of sudden appearance of these properties of human beings is something that I can sort of precisely nail down in terms of when exactly at that moment it happened and how it got propagated and all that. I think we've got to give God a chance to be God in that regard. What I can say is I can look at human beings and say there are things here about us that I cannot fully explain purely on the basis of naturalistic evolutionary biology. And I think that's interesting. When it comes to animals, I, you know, there's a lot of cat and dog lovers here. I've got to be really careful about this. <laughs> I'm sure many of you think your animals are spiritual creatures, and maybe they are. And again, this idea that the evolutionary genius uh, that God had in actually putting this whole creative process together, it would make sense, wouldn't it, uh, for that to generate some early features of what was ultimately to be manifest in us humans in full-blown form, whether it is an early evidence of some sort of moral behavior, whether it is early evidence of maybe something called free will. I know dog lovers who are quite convinced that their dogs make decisions about whether to be bad or good. I don't know if they're tr right about this, but they seem quite confident. But then you don't really, if you look hard, uh, see in any of those circumstances, even in our closest re relatives, uh, the primates, uh, this fully manifest consciousness plus free will plus reason plus judgment plus uh, spiritual hunger. You don't find spiritual hunger in other animals. You find that in all of our species. So there's something going on there. And exactly how that uh, gift was given uh, by God to our species, I'm pretty unclear about that. We go to okay, Mark. yes, we have a question from Tornell, if I can read it out loud for you, okay? Mm -hmm. Doesn't believing that God used evolution as a mechanism for creation imply an impersonal God? No. <laughs> but <let's... laughs> so if God used evolution as a mechanism for creation, but with the full intention that its ultimate outcome would be human beings, human beings who would have a sufficiently advanced brain to then receive uh, the moral law, this interest in seeking out what the source of that would be and ultimately seeking out for God, that sounds pretty personal to me. Certainly evolution can be couched in completely impersonal terms, but once you put God there as the author of it, and if you do it in a fashion that incorporates what we can see from other perspectives about God's interest in ourselves, then it seems pretty personal. Now, does it require that God step in along the way and inhabit the evolutionary process in some fashion? I don't know. I think you've got to be careful about the God of the gaps part of that there. But if God inhabited evolution in a way that basically included uh, in an ongoing way his purposes, that wouldn't bother me at all. And maybe that would be a, a more comfortable answer to the person asking this question about the need for a more personal involvement. But I don't see evolution being true as actually having a particular impact on whether it was a personal plan or an impersonal plan. It certainly seems to me that God did this in a fashion that had an intention, an intention of all of us, including having this conversation, and that that was uh, an intensely personal kind of plan all along. Back over to yes, sir. Is the mic on? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Dr. Collins. Accepting for the sake of argument that the existence of some God is possible and can be revealed through physical evidence, what evidence could you have possibly considered to allow you to conclude that this God must be the Christian God? Why do you not believe in various other versions of God around this world, like the Muslim God or the Jewish God or an impersonal mother nature? Furthermore, what evidence allowed you to conclude that there is one Christian God as 
argued by Christian doctrines. Not three gods, not root three over two gods, or since you are so fond of physical constants, not three times, ten, three times 10 to the eight gods. <laughs> what makes you think that you can even quantify God? Why do you talk only about one Christian God and not any of these other possibilities that are not eliminated by anything you've said today? Thank you. Thank you. Okay, great question. And again, a lot of the arguments that I put forward were entirely compatible with most monotheistic perspectives and even some pantheistic perspectives in the sense that I think one can look at the way the universe is put together and postulate that it makes more sense with a creator a creator who has a mind, a creator who's a mathematician, a creator who wanted complexity to be part of the universe than to basically disregard that. But that doesn't sound like the Christian God any more than the Muslim God or, or any other God that you'd like to propose uh, on your list. So how do we get to that? And again, this then becomes a very personal journey. You'll have to go on your own personal journey, and we all do, to figure out what you think the truth is. I did, I didn't, you know what? When I started doing my survey of world religions, I wasn't sure if any of them were going to be true, but the one I hoped would least likely be true was Christianity, because people would say, well, of course. You're in the United States. Everybody there seems to be Christian. So you go looking for faith, and what do you find? Christianity. Yeah, right. <laughs> but you know what? The truth of what I learned, I could not run away from. Again, let me point out the similarities between all those faiths you mentioned are profound. But you come to this person of Christ who's different than any of the other individuals you encounter in any of these other faiths. And I could not run away from that. I tried. I could not. It seemed to me that this was calling me to make a decision. The evidence required a verdict. And ultimately, the verdict that I came to after realizing that the evidence for Christ's existence was profound, we know some would say more about Jesus Christ as a historical figure than we know about Julius Caesar, and not just from the Bible, but from many other sources as well. And the evidence for this amazing miracle called the resurrection, which I as a scientist was not inclined to accept, is similarly very strong. If you don't buy that, read N.T. Wright's uh, amazing book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. Goes through all of this evidence from all this direction and comes to the conclusion that it is more plausible to believe that the resurrection was a literal event than it was not. And if it was a literal event of somebody who claimed to be the Son of God, then how can I walk away from it? And ultimately, I know there are very valid claims from other faiths, and this is very much a personal part of the conversation. And every person here has to make their own pathway down that road and figure out what is true. But for me, Christ is true. I, I was wondering if you could uh, explain a little bit more about how uh, moral law could not uh, evolve from or result from evolution, specifically looking at the two examples you brought up. In the case of Schindler, um, imagine you were one of the people, okay? So there's Schindler and a whole bunch of Jews, okay? Uh, Nash Equilibrium states that uh, in complex systems, uh, individuals should try and act uh, in a way that is no worse for them. And so if you were one of the people, would you hope that the person who happened to be Schindler risked his lift, life to attempt to save the other people, or that he would just do the more safe individual thing, which is to not risk his life and let all the other people die? It's pretty obvious that were you chosen to be a random person, you would want the person who was Schindler to attempt to save the people. Um, and it's essentially, how do you equate that uh, with uh, evolutionary sort of uh, the Nash equilibrium of a, a group, an individual can sort of subserviate their individual needs for serving the group better. So I'm not sure I completely understood the Nash equilibrium part of the question, but I will say we have free will, right? Oscar Schindler had free will. He could decide whether or not he was going to risk his life for these people who were not part of his own group, and he decided to do so. And from an evolutionary perspective, no matter what those people who he saved wanted him to do, he was the one making the decision, and he made a decision that was counter to what evolutionary pressures would have asked him for. Because no matter which version of sociobiology or evolutionary psychology or game theory you apply to this, the idea of an individual doing something sacrificial for people outside their own group falls outside the reach of any plausible theory. Now, you, unless you're going to say it's a misfiring, and that is an argument which 
I think Dawkins would say is, well, you know, we just got carried away with this altruism thing. Uh, we, it, was, it was something evolution told us we were supposed to do to our families, and then we lived in small villages, and there was an advantage to being good to those people. And now we're all mixed up and think we have to do it for everybody. Doesn't sort of ring true to me. Sorry, perhaps I could qualify. <laughs> um, if you don't consider them as a separate group, they're all humans. So in, in essence, the, the, moral, the moral good of that is he's preserving more humans. Ah, the the species is strong. That will fall apart because evolution has no power over a species if the entire species stays static. The only way evolution has any chance to advance is if some members of the species do better than others. Anything that causes the species to be equally successful is going to be a disaster from an evolutionary perspective. You can imagine selection operating on a group you can't imagine it operating on the whole species or the whole process fails. OK, here's another question from uh, Dwinelle Hall. Of all God's creations, why were humans the only ones given the gifts of language, moral law, free will, and an immortal soul? Isn't this a self-serving, anthropogenic excuse for saying humans are special? <laughs> Well, we are, aren't we? I mean, let's, let's, let's look at the facts. All of those uh, things that are mentioned there. In our observation on this planet, we humans seem to have these properties, and they do not appear to be in full-blown form represented elsewhere. So by definition, the data says we can be anthropocentric when it comes to these properties, whether that seems you know, selfish or not. It, the data is the data. So I'm not sure how that sort of fits together uh, with whether or not we should say that God did that. The facts are the facts. This is the way the world seems to be put together. Over here. Yes, sir. Hello. Um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, two arguments for, um, for kind of the hand of God working in the world have kind of come to, come to my mind or come to me recently. Not from myself, of course, but from other people. <laughs> uh, Antony flew uh, in 2004 after his debate with Gary Habermas. This was before he became a theist. Um, in an essay, he allowed for the hand of God specifically where life was kind of inserted into the world from like dead matter, and then there was life. And he said that there's a place where theists could say there's God working. Um, another place that I think is probably a little bit more, well, I don't know if it's more up your alley, but <laughs> uh, is others have made the case that the information contained in DNA could not have come from anything else other than an intelli than intelligence, simply because, I mean, because we look for we look for intelligence by looking for information. Like uh, I saw, I heard the example of uh, what's the, the the search for alien life forms. They look for rational, intelligent. Sure. series. And so they say, well, if we can find some sort of information, then we can say there's intelligence. And so they, they kind of extrapolate that to DNA. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So those are related questions, of course, because they both uh, question whether you could get to that first self-replicating organism that has DNA as its information molecule without God intervening or some supernatural force. Uh, I'm glad you brought it up. I didn't point to that. I will tell you that the origin of life theory is in somewhat of disarray at the moment. We don't really have a good idea that's, that's even remotely plausible, and when you look at it mathematically, uh, of how it is that we went from a planet that had no life on it four billion years ago to a planet that was teeming uh, with simple organisms uh, 3.85 billion years ago. That's a pretty short period of time. The, the sort of standard uh, response is, well, you started with RNA, because RNA can be both an enzyme as well as an information-carrying molecule, so it could both replicate itself and carry the information to replicate itself. But the conditions of the early planet would have been absolutely disastrous for RNA uh, to have any kind of stability. I don't know what the answer is going to be here, but it's, this is one of those places I would be nervous about attaching uh, God's uh, sovereignty to that spot because it is entirely possible that a better theory will come along, uh, might come along tomorrow, uh, of how life might have begun, including how information, a small bit at first, but then gradually over the course of time with some selection operating, uh, more complicated information could have in fact uh, arisen. That wouldn't bother me. Again, I would say if God had the intention of creating all of us and set in motion the appropriate physical laws, 
in order to make a small blue planet somewhere on the outer rim of a spiral galaxy just right in order to have this happen, well, that's good enough for me. He doesn't have to step in later on and sort of do the things that didn't quite go right. It seems to me God is greater if he doesn't have to step in than if he does. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, good evening, Dr. Collins. You stated uh, earlier, and I agree, that faith is uh, personal. Religion as such appears to be the consensus of the faith of many. Are you departing from the consensus that is Christianity, assuming that the Bible is some representation of this consensus? And if so, how do you decide where you agree and disagree with the Bible? That's a great question. And I, I'm glad you sort of brought up faith and religion as not necessarily equivalent terms. Um, and I've mostly talked about faith tonight because it seems to me when we get to religion, we quickly are starting to think about human institutions. And we humans, uh, down through the course of history, have been really good at taking the eternal truths that come from faith and getting them all mixed up and muddied up. They get poured into these dirty vessels called human beings and they come out not looking like clear water anymore. So what is the consensus of what Christianity means on the subject of evolution? I don't think there is one. I think you asked the appropriate question about how do you decide how to interpret scripture, uh, sort of hermeneutics. Uh, it seems to me that a thoughtful believer who's accepting the Bible as the word of God can still look at certain verses and be mystified by what their intention is. Uh, I don't know a lot of Christians, although I know a few, who think the book of Job is a literal story of a literal individual. Most Christians that I know think that that is an allegorical story of Job being uh, tried and tempted and beset by all kinds of trials uh, at the hands uh, of, uh, of Satan while God watched. Uh, it seems to me that if you look at Genesis 1 and 2, there are two stories of creation. Go back and read them tonight. The, the story in Genesis 1 and the story in Genesis 2 are not quite compatible with each other. So you can't say that both of those have to be interpreted literally or you've run already into a conflict. It seems to me that theologians down through the centuries have been wrestling with this and have generally come up with reasonable ideas about how to take a particular part of the Bible and figure out what it's trying to say. And just as I don't think God would have been well served to lecture to the Israelites about radioactive decay or, or uh, tectonic plates and how they shift around, uh, I think parts of the Old Testament, particularly those that are clearly not the record of eyewitnesses, uh, are appropriately considered as literature that is conveying important principles, but not necessarily precise scientific details. On the other hand, when I read parts of the Bible, like much of the New Testament, that appear to be the record of eyewitnesses or people who lived shortly after uh, Christ's life, I would be very hard pressed to have somebody come and say, oh, well, that was all an allegory. That's not the kind of literature it sounds like. I'm not a theologian. I'm not a, a scriptural interpreter. But I think that is a, a sensible, common sense approach to take that most people have followed down through the centuries. And maybe we're actually living in a somewhat aberrant time uh, in that in many situations, the Christian consensus, at least is put forward, by the most vocal speakers is that things have to be ultra literal or it's not really sincere. I don't think that is the way in which down through history the consensus has been held. Thank you. Thank you. Then a timely question from Dwinell. When are we going to stop? Is that? 9.45. <laughs> okay. okay. That was a joke. No. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Collins, what about miracles? Ah, what about miracles? Yeah, I get this question from time to time because scientists, you know, um, surely can't believe in miraculous events. And I've not seen a miracle, and I'm not sure that I will in my lifetime. But I do believe that the resurrection literally happened. So that's a miracle of the first order. How can I, as a scientist, sort of subscribe to something that violates natural laws? Well, the real question, isn't it, is do you believe in God? If you believe in God, and you believe that God is the author of those natural laws, then it is a very short step to the idea that God, in order to send a really important message, could decide to violate those natural laws in a way that we would interpret as a miraculous event. 
And that doesn't seem to be a logical inconsistency at all once you get to the point of saying God exists. At the same time, as a scientist, I think you have to be really cautious about accepting everyday experiences as miracles. When somebody says, oh, it's a miracle I got that parking space, I'm like, no. <laughs> Doesn't qualify. <laughs> And of course, as a physician, I've many times seen circumstances where people who had terrible diseases that I thought were going to take their life away and somehow they got better, and people have been praying for them. Is that a miracle? I don't know. When you look hard at those, you can usually come up with some natural explanation. So I just don't know. Uh, and it doesn't trouble me that I don't know. Again, I think the bottom line is, as a scientist, as a believer, you've got to be skeptical. But the, the idea that miracles could happen at those gate, great ganglions in history, where there is some critical message being sent by God Almighty, well, yeah, I have no problem with that. Hello. Um, uh, I've been to church with my girlfriend a few times. I'm not a Christian myself. Um, but when she mentions that they have like good Christmas food or something, then I, I go ahead and run along with her. But um, ah, they're trying to get you into their church now. They know exactly how to get to you. <laughs> yeah, unfortunately. But um, I guess my my question is: uh, you talked about bio uh, logos being um, something as a uh, some sort of a fusion, and you really emphasize that religion is an individualistic journey, and so. Um, I was mentioned a little bit earlier, but I was wondering if you could elaborate more on the Institute of Religion and uh, whether or not it's necessary, like, do you go to church or do, do we have to go to church? Can I just, like, read your bullet points and... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it sounds pretty good to me, so... <laughs> right. You just need the right PowerPoint file and it's all set. <laughs> no. Um, do I go to church? I'm not a very faithful church attender, I'll tell you, because I'm often uh, traveling on uh, trips like this, or I'm uh, spending time with family. So I, and I, at times, I've been deeply engaged in a church. I was even a music minister for a while at the present time. I have not sort of found myself in the midst of a fellowship that seems to really fit. But I don't feel that that's uh, a, a disqualifier for a believer. I'm answering your, your question honestly. I think, basically, if you're going to become a person of faith, it's got to be what's in here and not what's out there in that building with the stained glass windows. And, uh, well, there are some pretty important bullet points, sure. Uh, but they have to be, I think, things that you explore in a little bit more detail than the bullet points, or they won't sustain you. Uh, this is the most important question you'll ever ask. Is there a God? It's worth spending time on. I'm speaking not just to you, but to everybody who's here. If you've not had the chance to spend time on it, uh, do so. Don't wait for advancing age or some crisis uh, to force you to it, because this is a way to enrich your life. And whatever decision you come to, to be confident that you've arrived at a, at a decision that's, that's true is going to be a source of great strength uh, for the rest of your life. Well, I have two short questions, the first pertaining importance to the second. Um, the first one has to do with the Human Genome Project, because uh -huh. I was wondering if there's anything in our genes that indicates an age limit, because you know you see like dogs live maybe certain years and people live certain years. And then if there's anything in the genes that indicates an age limit, then I was wondering about the pre-flood period and shortly after Noah's time, because in the Bible, you know, people live like 900, 400, 300 years. And how, 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 how do we go with that, with genes and everything? Cool question. Well, yes, I think evolution requires species not to have infinitely long lifespans. Otherwise, you can never sort of make room for the next thing. And so uh, there is a natural reason why life is limited. And we are learning from a variety of directions that there are specific genes that play a role in that. There's something called telomerase, uh, which is an enzyme coded for by a gene that keeps those tips of your chromosomes that I was talking about from getting kind of ragged. And uh, ultimately, it, wa it wears out, and those chromosomes getting ragged results in the death of a cell. My lab is actually studying a disease called progeria, where kids age at about seven times the normal rate and die about age 11 or 12 of heart attacks or strokes. And it's a single gene. In fact, it's a single letter out of three billion that does that. 
And we're now learning that there are subtle variations in that same gene that may allow some people to live to be 100. There is certainly a lot of interest in discovering how to manipulate uh, genetics in order to try to extend lifespan, especially as my colleagues and myself get older, we seem more interested in that. <laughs> <laughs> but <laughs> but I'm, I, I don't know how to explain uh, the stories of Methuselah and others who live 900 years uh, in, the, uh, in the Old Testament. Is that, in fact, some change in the biology, some change in the environment would seem to be more likely? Is that one of those particular instances that we should take absolutely literally? I don't know. But I think uh, we will probably not, with our science, be able to go back and figure that out, lacking a time machine. I think we're going to have to continue to wonder. OK, our, our last question. Uh, Dr. Collins tomorrow has to spend the day at that uh, junior university you know, across the bay. <laughs> So uh, we're going to ask for one last question from this, uh, the woman over here, and then uh, Ansi will close us. Okay. Yes, please. Yeah. Hi, good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm about to expose my ignorance of any scientific matters right now with this question, but um, a lot of, um, I guess, agnostic and atheist friends and family of mine um, kind of scratch their heads when they look at you know, religiously inclined people, kind of wondering what, what the big hoopla is all about. And um, one dear person to me even, um, kind of is very interested in science and explained how um, he kind of believes, I don't know, in like a, a god gene necessarily, but just explaining how like the Neanderthals had used more of their limbic system and they were more concerned with the afterlife and, you know, burying the dead with um, these ceremonies and things like that. And whereas like the, you know, Cro-Magnums to follow use more of the intellect and cerebrum. And um, I'm wondering um, if you think that some are more predisposed towards spirituality, and even people have different levels of passion, spiritual passion. Um, just because many people may be religious doesn't mean that they're, you know, the really, um, like, passionate theologians delving into these issues. And um, it, could any of that be biologically explained depending on things, uh, neural synapses or limbic system being stimulated? Can you induce, you know, spiritual, um, experiences, um, you know, because uh, a lot of people, um, I've heard they just say, well, you know, my limbic system isn't as uh, active as that person's or something <laughs> like that. And, um, or, or are these people just suppressing slash denying a hunger to know that you say we all have? So what would, how would you respond to that? So I, it's, it's a question that's being explored, I think, uh, in many interesting ways by, for instance, looking at imaging experiments to see is there something that's going on in the brain uh, using a PET scan, for instance, in somebody who's having a spiritual experience or deep meditation? And in fact, there are uh, very interesting findings for people who have those experiences lighting up particular parts of the brain. And some have argued, well, that means that it's not a real experience. And others have said, and I would say this latter, uh, that come on now, that means it is a real experience. You've just demonstrated there's something profound going on. This is not somebody just making up something. And of course, if you're going to have a spiritual experience, the idea that would have a neurological counterpart uh, seems like a necessity, not a surprise. Uh, so there you have it. Now, are, are some of us more susceptible to religious inclinations than others? There was a book published by a colleague of mine at NIH uh, three or four years ago called The God Gene made it on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, it was a pretty far stretch uh, from the data uh, to come to that conclusion. Basically, what he did was he looked at personality traits that you can measure on a standard personality test. One of those is transcendence, sort of the ability to rise above uh, sort of day-to-day -day materialistic uh, perspective. And he found a gene that seemed to have a variant in it that might have accounted for like less than 1% of the scoring of somebody on a transcendent scale on a personality test, which was never replicated by anybody else. And that was enough to write a book called The God Gene. So this is like, whoa, way out of there. Uh, but I think it would not surprise me uh, if, in fact, as we get smarter about this, that there are aspects of human personality that have some heritability that may make some of us somewhat more open uh, to the idea of spirituality. But they're going to be very small effects on, on, this, on the scheme of things. And I don't think, from the study of history and the study of cultures, that you can find very many examples uh, of widespread disinterest in spirituality. It seems to be part of who we are. 
Maybe a little more, maybe a little less, but it's probably a universal feature. It's part of what it means to be human. Thank you. Yours. Let's thank Dr. Collins. For more information about the Veritas Forum, including additional recordings and a calendar of upcoming events, please visit our website at www.veritas.org.